gaze and not sin. And Jesus isn't asking the gay person to change and be straight. That's right. The Bible doesn't condemn gay. Do you? Yeah, a lot of you do. So I would ask you not to condemn gays because the Bible doesn't condemn gays. Of course, as usual, lots of you do condemn gays. And um, so I would like to tell you not to condemn gays because it's not in the Bible. And uh, the reason I say it's not in the Bible is because there are particular verses that you say says gay is sin. One of them is uh, Romans chapter 1, 26 and 27. But the actual context is verse 18 through 32. And the details is Paul wrote this book of Romans in Corinth. And he was sitting there uh, as he was writing and he could look over and you could see the Temple of Apollo. That wasn't the Temple of Apollo that I just showed you, uh, but I just showed you something about uh, you know, something, uh, over here at Fisherman's Door. And uh, so Paul wrote every day and night and everything where he could look out his window or sit out in the front porch and look at the Temple of Apollo. And then he can. Um, here to show you that uh, you can look over at the mountains. There's one. We would probably call it a hill, uh, but it's called Acro Corinth. And it's pretty steep. And from the Temple of Apollo, it's about three and a half kilometers, however many miles that ends up being. Uh, when I was there, after I did a TV program at the Temple of Apollo, uh, it was a holiday time. And you know, one thing good about the holiday time, if you ever think about going to Greece or something, maybe March 25th is a good week to go. Because uh, that week, uh, you might look at it and confirm if it's before or that starts the week. They have a holiday. And uh, so all the parks are free. And, uh, of course, you don't have buses running and stuff. You're going to have to take a taxi. The trains will run. And so um, I got there to Corinth, and I took a taxi over to ancient Corinth and did a program at the Temple of Apollo. And I could have took a taxi on up uh, to Acro Corinth, but the taxi driver I happened to deal with... Uh, he was kind of iffy and hesitant and all this kind of stuff. Uh, couldn't figure out it or know about how much it's going to cost me. And so I just uh, said, uh, forget it. And I walked up there. And when I came back and got to the ancient Corinth again, I did take a taxi. And that taxi driver pretty much knew everything. And, and he was actually a dollar cheaper going back to the train station. But I, I hiked up there, you know, three and a half kilometers to the mountain. And that mountain is really tall mountain. Uh, uh, I'm not going to say it's as high as Mount Sai, but it's, it's uh, probably not a far cry off. And anyway, I got there and, and, and you know, it's kind of weird. Uh, those ancient days, people, people like to do some fantastic construction with heavy, heavy stuff. And, and this mountaintop, hilltop, Acro Corinth, had a wall all around the top. And there was fortifications as you enter into what you got about halfway up the mountain by the road. Then, then you enter into a gate that goes through a wall and there's about three layers of fortifications before you're inside. But when you're looking at that and seeing all that wall all around the place and and the things that they built there, which was torn down pretty much by the, you know, now, you know, and, but you can imagine, boy, what an effort it was to build such structures so high up a steep mountain. And I went on up to the very top where the Temple of Aphrodite was, and it's said to have a thousand temple prostitutes. Uh, 
and uh, that mountain had chambers all over it, and you're walking around, <coughs> and uh, there's area you can see that there's holes going in, some places are got doors and everything that are locked, but, but you can see that th there's, a, there's a lot of tunnel-like things, and who knows what's underneath, there's a lot of activity that used to be on that mountain, so it must have been something in the heyday of uh, Paul when he wrote the book of Romans. Now, now Corinth was a, a seaport at the time, had about 400,000 people. So you got sailors from all over the world coming to uh, Corinth. And uh, today, when sailors go all over the world, they, they find the hookers and prostitutes and, and what they might call girlfriends in every port. You know, it's, it's, it's a saying, kind of like it. Like we joke about it, sailor has a, a girl in every port. <laughs> Actuality, that's not such a good thing, you know. Uh, of course, uh, the sailors seem to think it's a great thing. The, the, the whole idea of Christianity would be you find one person and uh, stay with them the rest of your life. And uh, uh, But heterosexuals don't like to do that a lot, and, and, uh, and they need to sow wild oats and stuff before they settle down. A lot of you watching me that are heterosexual, you know your fun times. Some of you might have actually fell in love right away. The first person I ever met, I stayed 10 years with. And uh, the person I'm with now, we're married, and I've been, uh, well, that was back in 1990 when uh, we moved in together and got married uh, a couple of years ago. So I've been with him uh, quite a while. I'm not running out to every person there is. Like, you know, that's a heterosexual thing. Well, gays do it too, because human beings do things like this. And But the kings and queens of uh, sexual immorality will always be heterosexuals. And in Paul's day, it was nonetheless. The, and Paul didn't like something. He didn't like the idea of Christians or uh, of traditional Jewish people going to fertility temples for ritual sex. And that's what they were doing. And in Moses' day, they did the same thing. And so Paul wasn't very nice about it. He describes some vile type passions, uh, which describes uh, orgies. And this is what happened. This is what the custom of fertility cult religions, the Temple of Aphrodite, Aphrodite the uh, Temple of Apollo. Pretty much all the gods in those days were related to fertility cults, and they had their sodomites. The word sodomites doesn't mean citizen of Sodom, and it doesn't mean sodomy. It means male temple prostitute, which means that, you know, you can imagine going to a Christian church and you're out there and the pastor is preaching up a fervor. And, and then he's saying, you know, people, you know, why don't you commit yourself in a big way, you know, come get baptized in the Holy Spirit or come up here and really commit yourself to Jesus Christ. And uh, so uh, they, um, you, you know, you probably might have been one of them. You go up to the altar and you commit yourself to Jesus in a big way, you rest your life to him. And, uh, well, in those days, you didn't just somehow magically became a sodomite. You felt a kind of a call. You heard a kind of a sermon and felt that you needed to be this kind of a sacred person. And so, and you committed yourself to that and made the arrangements with the priest to, uh, you know, what percentage goes to the fertility temple and what percentage goes to buying you food and lodging and so forth and and those uh, were interesting times and so if it was all religion type of deal you would have um, uh, these sailors come to port they worship these pagan gods fertility gods and so they're not just going to go you find an ordinary hooker. You, usually when you're trying to look and study these type of things, you can find them in everything. But uh, it's going to be the 
temple prostitutes that, that ruled the day there. And so these uh, people from all foreign ports, and Paul's uh, particularly dislike of Christians and, and uh, Jewish folk, go into these uh, ritual orgies. And uh, there were a, something that was more sacred in these uh, types of ritual sex, and that was a male temple prostitute. And they would um, be much more secret, sacred than the female temple prostitutes. Now in Deuteronomy, it calls um, the sodomites, they call them like dogs or something. And it says that the, the female ones were whores. But when you look at the Hebrew, they're, they're the sodomites. That's the word sodomite there. And the female one was the woman version of the word for male temple prostitute, so female temple prostitute. In all, there's 14 verses used to condemn gays. You can probably throw in a couple of others. They're pretty much more vague and everything. But uh, to get a little bit more distinct of which were the common ones used, 14 of them, seven use the word sodomite. And several of those verses, or a few of those verses, aren't used that much. They're kings. First Kings, there's I think there's one. In the Second Kings, there's uh, uh, four or five, four something like that, or vice versa. And then the, the main ones, of course, is uh, Deuteronomy. And uh, then the other ones is in um, uh, First Corinthians six nine, then First Timothy ten one to ten. These words mean male temple prostitute. They don't mean homosexual. When you go back to Paul's day when he wrote the book of Romans and you're looking around the town, you know, I walked all over the town and, and read up on a lot of stuff. And, 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 Opportunity to, to see some of these places and know what heterosexuals do, and it, it is especially disgusting to hear homophobes say that the Bible condemns gays using the word sodomite because sodomite does not condemn gays; it condemns male temple prostitutes for a number of reasons, and that is that. Um, they are worshiping other gods and they um, as Paul colors her you know, how, how um, we um, try to say that that uh, worshiping other gods you know, like in Leviticus like we can get in Leviticus uh, saying that that says gay is sin because man is like mankind. But no, that was uh, again um, talking about uh, the, your man with man. You've got two words for man there. And one of the words when you in, translate over to English, now when, when the translators translate over to English, um, they come up with the word man. And then in the description there, it says the actual meaning of the word man, and uh, as well as some other meanings, because you can have some other Greek or Hebrew words. And when you read the little caption down below, it says often the full meaning of the word is not translated over to English. In Greek, you got like the word love. Well, the full meaning of the word love is not translated over to English. Usually you can figure it out because um, the rest of the sentence kind of describes that when you're talking about loving God, it's not a sexual thing, but if you're talking about loving your wife, 
then it, it could be sexual and it could be this kind of love that you have to love with your wife and as such. And so um, um, we um, have these same things in Hebrew. translations, which could be correct. I mean, it, when scholars are translating, they gather together um, possible meanings to be correct. And in this case, the, there are 13 possible ways to translate it. Now, three of those ways actually relate to translating um, to a man and a man, maybe. It doesn't necessarily mean that, but it can mean just the way the homophobe would kind of be tickled pink about. The problem with that, when you use that word uh, that way, then you see this word is in a sentence. And when you misuse a word, it destroys the sentence, the grammar of the sentence. And this is what would happen if you use any of these situations. Uh, for that word in the Hebrew. And uh, so you have to um, know that I, how you use that word has to be something that doesn't destroy the sentence. So the ten other ones doesn't destroy the sentence. It makes it perfectly readable in the, in the Hebrew. And that, that word is saying um, that the uh, Hebrew means a heterosexual man that has slept, had sex with a woman and enjoyed it. So in other words, you could make it real simple in English by saying a practicing heterosexual man. So you know, so the Hebrew of, in Leviticus chapter 18 or 20, both of them, they use the same word, would mean practicing heterosexual man. And we have this word abomination. Every single use in the Bible for the word abomination relates to worshiping other gods. And God particularly hated that. Now he also, uh, the word womankind in that verse, uh, when you read it, it starts out by saying this is a sexual, immoral woman, especially being unfaithful uh, to the husband, having uh, extramarital relationships. And, and God treats other gods as uh, if you went to them, then you were committing adultery to God. Well, God is using this sentence in the word abomination to indicate that when this heterosexual man goes to this other man, it's like you turning, a, a, you husband, going to some other woman and committing adultery against your wife. And so these heterosexual men, and it's always emphasizing, because it's already happening in the heathen world, the pagan world, that they would... Uh, be um, going to these gods because they were their gods. But what the Bible Moses did like was Hebrews would go to these gods and um, they would uh, have sex with these temple prostitutes. And so the um, this is going to other gods, which is committing adultery to God. And the ritual sex, you know, all, this is with a, a male temple prostitute. So a heterosexual practicing man went to a uh, male temple prostitute for ritual sex, important ritual sex to other uh, fertility gods and goddesses. 
But yet somehow or another, you turn this verse around and say that it's talking about gay. It's, you, you, are, you are assuming it's talking about it. a man and going to bed with another man like a man goes to bed with a woman. And uh, so you're, you're, you're trying to make it a, like a marriage situation uh, because <laughs> how can you accept a man going to bed with a woman unless they're married? But, uh, but it doesn't say they're a married man. It doesn't say that it's comparing a heterosexual couple to a homosexual couple. But somehow this is what you want it to mean. And you don't want to explain how you got it that way. You don't want to go into the Hebrew. You don't want to go into the history. When you go into the history, um, you always find that heterosexual men uh, always going out there to deal with God's promises. So, you know, if you're going to condemn gays, at least try to condemn them. That condemns them. But then you have to Because when you do that, um, you find that that you're <clears throat> unable to discover in verses in the Bible that condemns gay. In fact, what you end up doing is finding that there are a couple of gay marriages. And Jesus said is a complete respecting gay couple. And uh, on and on and on. You can only find good things about actual gays in the Bible. And the things that you say that condemn gays aren't condemning gays. They're basically condemning heterosexual men that goes to fertility uh, prostitutes. For people, gay is not sin. And Jesus is not asking the gay person to change. So why are you? You know, I would really love to hear your explanation of a verse, but I can't get it from you. I've been on TV here since 1985, weekly. And, and you know, for years, I've been on many times a week. You know, I'm on at least seven times a week. And sometimes back to back, I turn on the TV randomly sometimes, there I am. And, and it's not just once, you know, I wait till my program gets over, then I'm back on again. It's just, it's kind of cool that there, there's, uh, that I'm on so many times. Who would ever thought, you know? I would have never thought I would be on TV that many times. I thought I was lucky to be once a week. But, um, and you can uh, see my program. They're, they're um, uh, 24-7 on On Demand. You can go to Seattle Media, no, rather, Seattle Community Media, uh, org, And it says, Watch Now, in one of the menus. And when you click that, you, you look down the list and you see Gates for Jesus. When you click that, you see all my programs. You can pick any one of them, watch it anytime, day or night. Go to my website, gaysforjesus.com, and it shows you right away the last several programs that you can watch right there on the spot. Gay is not sin. Jesus is not asking for gay to change and be straight. Do you know Jesus? We're living in some curious times. We just got through this month of September where some 33 nearly, if not prophetic, events took place significant event. Then we went into October and we had some, we got, in South Carolina they had a, a thousand year, one in a thousand year flood. Can you believe that? Now we're not talking about 500 year storms or something, we're talking about thousand year storm and South Carolina just had theirs. You, you watch um, world news like BBC or something like that and they're talking about um, um, Spain had a, a, in five hours, got two months worth of rain. And, and China is just being devastated by hurricanes and tornadoes. You know, this month is starting up to be pretty disastrous weather-wise. So if you don't know Jesus, turn and say, Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God, and that God rose you on the third day. Come and forgive my sin. Come into my life. It's a simple prayer like that. Could just say, now read the King James Version. Start with the book of John. Ask Jesus to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Read Acts chapter 2. You got a place of pain? Touch that place right now. 
Jesus heals today. So touch that place of your pain right now. You got your hand on that spot? In the name of Jesus, be healed.